Well, hello and welcome to our third Thursday webinar. I am Tom Sandry, and today we are going to be talking about ground fault protection, detection, and locating of ground faults. Now, electrical system ground fault protection is vital uh, to ensure safety of personnel, equipment, and to reliably maintain systems based on uh, the loads they serve. The topics that we're going to be covering in today's webinar include the importance of ground fault protection, common methods of electrical system grounding, methods of ground fault protection that may be implemented, and methods for locating ground faults on ungrounded both AC and DC systems. All right, let's get started. While the more powerful three-phase or arcing faults receive a large amount of attention when discussing electrical system protection, ground faults present a far more common and potentially more dangerous occurrence uh, for personnel and equipment. Grounding, bonding, and ground fault protection are vital to decrease shock hazards to personnel during a ground fault, such as when a current carrying conductors, insulation fails, or inadvertently falls to ground. Now, ground fault protection allows an electrical system to be maintained in a reliable manner, matching the needs, loads it serves, and to isolate undesirable fault conditions in a quick and ideally selective manner. Now, per the NFPA 70 or National Electric Code, Electrical systems that are grounded shall be connected to earth in a manner that will limit the voltage imposed by lightning, line surges, or unintentional contact with higher voltage lines, and that will stabilize the voltage to earth during normal operation. Ground fault protection for specific equipment such as generators, transformers, or motors is worthy of several articles in the NFPA 70 and will only be discussed slightly here. Unless noted otherwise, all discussions of ground fault protection applies primarily to the coordination of distribution protective devices. All right, the importance of ground fault protection. Well, ground as defined in the National Electrical Code is simply the earth. A ground fault occurs when a conductor at a voltage other than the earth reference meets another conductive material connected to ground. Depending on the type of grounding system installed, this can lead to transient or sustained overvoltage, undervoltage, and undesirable single line to ground fault currents. If not isolated, these faults can harm personnel and damage to systems or even propagate into faults of a higher magnitude. It should be noted that an effective ground fault current path's primary purpose is to keep non-current carrying conductive materials as close to the system ground potential as possible and to provide a safe path for ground fault current in the event of a fault. However, the absence of an equipment grounding conductor, which is part of an effective ground fault current path, does not mean an electrical system is ungrounded or that ground fault protection cannot be used. The zero sequence impedance of a set of conductors is impacted by several factors, including conductor arrangement, presence of grounding paths, equipment, grounding conductors, cable shields, parallel paths, etc., and the surrounding environment. All right, let's briefly look at some grounding standards and codes. All electrical designs or construction must adhere to applicable standards and codes. The following are some of the items that relate to grounding and bonding of electrical systems and ground fault protection requirements. 
In the National Electrical Code, we have Article 250, Grounding and Bonding. Within 250, we have Article 250.4, General Requirements for Grounding and Bonding. 250.20, Alternating Current Systems to be Grounded. Article 250.130, Equipment Grounding Conductor Connections. Article 230.95, Groundfall Protection of Equipment for Services. Article 215.10, Groundfall Protection of Equipment for Feeders. 240.13, Groundfall Protection of Equipment. And we also have the NFPA 780, Standard for the Installation of Lightning Protection Systems. We have Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA standard, 1910.304, Wiring Design and Protection. Also, OSHA standard 3007, Ground Fault Protection on Construction Sites. Next, let's take a brief look at grounding system types. The term grounded or grounding is often loosely used in the industry. Grounding per National Electric Code is the connection to ground or to a conductive body that extends the ground connection. Grounding includes both equipment and systems. Equipment grounding refers to the connection together of the non-current carrying conductive parts of equipment and to the system ground a conductor or to the grounding electrode or both. System grounding refers to the connection of the power system grounded conductor or neutral to earth ground through a grounding electrode conductor. There are different types of system grounding practices in the industry, such as solidly grounded systems, either low or high impedance or resistive grounded systems, as well as ungrounded systems. The ungrounded circuit historically has been selected for those systems where service continuity is of primary concern. An ungrounded system is a system circuit or apparatus in which there is no intentional connection between the system conductors and earth. A system may still be considered ungrounded if there is a possible connection to earth ground through potential measuring devices or very high impedance devices. The term ungrounded is somewhat of a misnomer because there is a capacitive coupling to ground of the phase windings and conductors. This is represented in blue on the schematic. Now, ungrounded systems, while less common and present, offer the following advantages. Low line-to-line -line ground fault current, because ground fault current is dependent on the capacitive current returning through the network phase to ground capacitance. No flash hazard for personnel for accidental first occurrence line-to-ground fault. Continued operation of processes on the first occurrence of a line-to-ground fault. However, even with these advantages, having an ungrounded system can make it difficult for personnel to locate line-to-ground faults. And therefore, we're going to be talking a bit about that uh, later in this webinar. It also places personnel at risk during maintenance and offers little control over transient overvoltage. Now, there are two main types of AC system grounding, the solidly grounded systems and the impedance or resistive grounded systems. The benefits of grounded systems include they provide a common reference point, improve safety, better protection for equipment, Ground fault location can be detected relatively easily. Electrostatic accidents can be better avoided. 
and they allow better control of transient over voltage. Now, let's first look at the solidly grounded system. Solidly grounded electrical systems have a grounded conductor connected to earth ground through a grounding electrode conductor with no intentionally added impedance or resistance in the circuit. The general requirement for solidly grounded systems can be found in the National Electric Code Article 250.4a, with some exceptions. National Electrical Code Article 215.10 and 240.13 require ground fault protection where low voltage protective equipment is rated 1000 amperes or greater. Now, solidly grounded systems are the most common type of system and offer the following advantages. They provide supply to line neutral loads ensures that ground fault in one phase does not cause the voltage of the other two phases to increase appreciably. No possibility of transient over voltage. Among these advantages, there are also a few disadvantages, including high severity of arc flash hazards, high fault current values, high possibility of single phase fault becoming a three phase fault. Our next system grounding method we'll look at is the impedance or resistive grounded systems. Impedance or resistive grounding may be either of two classes, a high resistance or a low resistance, distinguished by the magnitude of ground fault current permitted to flow. Although there are no recognized standards for the levels of ground fault current that define these two classes, in practice there is a clear difference. High resistance grounding typically uses ground fault current levels of 10 amps or less. Although some specialized systems at voltages in the 15 kV class may have higher ground fault current levels. Low resistance grounding typically uses ground fault current levels of at least 100 amps, with currents in the 200 to 1000 amp range being more usual. Both types are designed to limit transient over voltage to a safe level. However, the high resistance method usually does not require immediate clearing of a ground fault since the fault current is limited to a very low level. This low level must be at least equal to the system total capacitance to ground charging current. The protective scheme associated with high resistive grounding is usually detection and alarm rather than immediate trip out. In general, the use of high resistive grounding on systems where the line to ground fault current exceeds 10 amps should be avoided because of the damage potential of an arcing current larger than 10 amps in a confined space. Now the advantage of impedance or resistive grounded systems include limits the ground fault current to a lower level this is controllable depending on the type of impedance equipment installed. Controls transient over voltages. Reduces line voltage drop caused by ground fault. For high impedance systems, continued operation of the process facility on the first occurrence of a line to ground fault while the fault is being located. The disadvantages. If line neutral connected loads are required, a separate transformer must be installed to serve those loads. Equipment such as breakers must be rated for line line voltages. For example, slash rated breakers, 480 slash 277 volts, alternating current rate of breakers are not allowed to be used on an impedance grounded system. Now, 
For more information on grounding system basics, check out our YouTube channel. Back on July of 2022, we did a webinar uh, that covered this topic of impedance or resistive grounding systems. So feel free to check out our past Third Thursday webinars uh, by subscribing or going to the ProTech Equipment Resources YouTube page. Now, how is ground fault protection performed? Well, the type of ground fault protection employed and how it is measured are mostly determined by the type of system grounding employed, but are generally limited to voltage and current based detection systems. Knowledge of sequence networks, especially the zero sequence network, is vital to understanding why a certain detection system is or is not ideal for a given type of system grounding. However, that is beyond the scope of this webinar. The National Electrical Code Article 250 provides specific requirements for the type of protection that must be implemented for a given type of grounding system. All right, so now let's look at ground fault protection in grounded systems. Ground fault protection on solidly grounded and impedance or resistive grounded systems generally employ current-based detection systems, though the preferred form of measuring ground current in each system varies with the expected magnitude of ground fault current. Each system may use residual ground fault detection, grounded return detection, or core balance detection. However, the latter may be overly sensitive for solidly grounded systems. All right, now let's look at the ground fault protection ungrounded systems. Ground fault protection on ungrounded systems are normally voltage based as no ground fault current will flow if only one conductor is faulted to ground. If a second conductor were to fault to ground, the fault would be phase to phase and would not introduce significant ground fault current. As the line to ground voltage uh, on the unfaulted phases of an ungrounded system experiencing a fault will increase to match the line to line voltage, an over voltage relay must be used to protect these systems per the National Electric Code 250.21b. High impedance ground systems can operate very similarly to ungrounded systems. So a protection system based upon voltage detection may also be advisable for these systems. Now, while current transformers may be installed in multitude of arrangements, Thanks to advancements in relay and protection technologies, it is rarely necessary to install them in anything other than a Y arrangement. For existing systems that have CTs installed in another manner, such as Delta, the methods of ground fault detection discussed here may not apply. Now, residual ground fault detection systems use CTs installed for each set of phase conductors and neutral if applicable to determine the ground fault current. Traditionally, this was accomplished by combining one set of CT secondaries before the relay or trip unit such that the phasers would sum cancel to yield the unbalanced current equal to the ground fault current. In most modern relay protection systems, the protective device calculates the current unbalance internally from the direct input of the phase CTs eliminating the need for additional CTs. The core balance ground fault detection. Core balance ground fault uh, detection systems are referred to by a wide variety of names. The zero sequence, 
window CT or donut CT, but all do the same thing. Install a single large CT around all phase conductors and neutral if applicable. The CT measures the vector sum of the current carrying conductors in a similar but more direct manner than the residual ground fault detection method, but does not need to be sized for the full fault current as is needed for individual phase CTs. Now, care must be given when installing cables that provide a ground or neutral uh, current return path. For example, cable shields, integral ground connectors, etc., where core balance detection systems are employed in order to ensure the return path conductors either do not pass through the window CT or where they do pass back through the same CT in the opposite direction. If the shielding is not installed correctly, the relay could operate prematurely. The ground return ground fault detection. Ground return ground fault detection systems use a CT installed on the ground fault return path to the source, generally at the ground bus. While this system provides good sensitivity and control, it is not popular due to the potential for alternating ground fault return paths, such as through a conductive conduit bonded to structural steel that is itself grounded. Medium voltage impedance grounded systems often use this method by measuring the current at the connection from the impedance to ground. Ground differential protection systems can be considered a subset of ground return detection systems when examining three-phase systems. CTs are installed in the ground fault return path of each feeder. If the current measured by the CT installed in the ground return path differs from the sum of the currents measured by the other CTs, the system would operate. Ground Neutral Voltage Detection Ground Neutral Voltage Detection When a single phase in an ungrounded system falls to ground, the Y point of the source increases from effectively zero to the normal operating line to ground voltage. An over voltage relay installed to either directly measure the voltage at the Y point or to measure the secondary voltage of a transformer installed between the Y point and ground can therefore be used to detect the fault. In many ungrounded systems, a special type of ground fault relay, a broken delta voltage uh, over voltage relay, is used to measure zero sequence components to provide sensitive protection. The ground neutral voltage detection method may also be used in high impedance, low voltage systems. All right, so now let's look at how to find the fault. The conventional method of detecting a fault in an ungrounded system is the three bulb method. Three bulbs, one connected between each phase and the ground. Under normal conditions, these bulbs glow uniformly. In the event of a ground fault, the bulbs connected to the faulted phase is extinguished and the rest of the bulbs glow brighter. Basically, to find a ground fault on an ungrounded system, you'd have to turn off one load at a time until the lights return to normal. Obviously, this can be very time consuming and disruptive. When searching for ground faults in ungrounded systems, another approach is to transmit current through the fault and establish a fault current. The injected current can be either an AC signal or it can be a pulse DC output. 
A pulsed output often needs to be synchronized with the receiver and can be affected by the capacitance on an ungrounded system. When an AC uh, trace signal is used, high levels of capacitance in the system will not drown out the signal. The capacitance will instead cause a phase shift between the voltage and current. This phase shift can be measured and the receiver can then determine which circuit has the real fault and which circuit is only drawing current due to system capacitance. Now here's a demonstration of a technique that uses an injected 20 Hz signal. The battery ground fault tracer locates ground faults in ungrounded DC battery systems. Various standards require action when the impedance between any battery polarity and earth ground falls below a specified limit. In the case of nuclear fuel plants, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission requires audits and appropriate action when this impedance is deemed unsafe. Other facilities come under the guidelines of the National Electric Code, NFPA, IEEE standards, and OSHA requirements for safe operation of DC battery systems in an ungrounded environment. How the BGFT works. The BGFT applies a 20 Hz signal between the battery bus and station ground. This is accomplished by connecting the transmitter via the source leads to an accessible battery bus and to a ground bus located in a distribution cabinet. A two-step process then begins to identify both the magnitude and location of the fault. First, suspect feeder cables are identified by measuring the flow of fault current to ground on all the output circuits from the cabinet. Then a bridge balance measurement is performed to determine the value of capacitance and resistance of the suspected ground fault. Once a ground fault condition is revealed, either through monitoring equipment or inspection, the battery ground fault tracer can be used to identify, track, and locate the fault or faults in the DC distribution system. No ground identified on the negative bus. The positive bus clearly shows a ground fault. Initial transmitter settings. Set output voltage switch to disconnect. Set voltage control fully counterclockwise to minimum. Set all capacitance selector switches fully counterclockwise to their minimum position. Set the resistance selector switches fully clockwise with the leftmost switch set to open. Connect the current source leads to the voltage output jack, J3. Insert by lining up the keyway with the receptacle slot and push in and turn to the right. Attach the red source lead to the positive post of battery cell number one or any one of the battery bus connections suspected of having a ground fault. Attach the black source lead to the system ground connection. Turn the power switch to the on position. The capacitance and resistance controls should be set in their initial positions as outlined earlier.
The ready indicator will illuminate, indicating the readiness of the transmitter power oscillator. The output voltage connect switch can now be placed into the connect position. The amount of test voltage required will greatly depend upon the magnitude of fault impedance to be located and the system requirements for injecting signals onto the distribution bus. Connect the two parts of the receiver, the clamp-on current probe that surrounds the cable to be examined, and the display and metering unit. Remove sufficient cabinet work to expose the DC supply bus feeder connections. Begin tracing the ground fault by clamping the current probe around the cable coming in and out of the breakers. The faulted cable will be identified with a measurement of current on the receiver meter. The ground fault has been identified at circuit breaker number 6, the data center. Defining the fault impedance is a better, more accurate method to locate ground faults. You can locate ground faults by tracing the circuits with the higher, receiver values without using the feedback loop to determine which faults are real and which are phantom. Phantom faults are caused by high capacitance sections. It is recommended, however, to use the feedback loop on the first panel to possibly eliminate high capacitance sections. Then, while leaving the transmitter at its location, use the receiver to trace all other high readings until all faults are located. A feedback cable coupled to a decade bridge that defines the true impedance and allows a true resistance value of the fault to be recognized is used to help eliminate false impedance to ground. With the feedback control switches set to the blue numbers, start with the capacitance section of the bridge. Observe the receiver display and dial in a capacitance from the bridge section. If the feedback cable is properly aligned, the display reading should start to decrease 
or remain the same. If the display value starts to increase, then the feedback cable is entering the current probe from the wrong direction. Either reverse direction at the transmitter panel or change the orientation of the cable at the current probe. If the display value remains the same, then the fault impedance is resistive in content and no further capacitance nulling is required. Note that the molded banana plug on the feedback loop lead is tabbed. The tab plug inserts into the negative input of J2. Place the feedback loop lead through the current probe and then place the current probe around a non-faulted feeder. The feedback control on the transmitter will be used to balance out the unwanted phantom current. While watching the current reading on the receiver, begin to adjust the capacitance switches until the receiver meter shows zero. Our tracing efforts have taken us to the RTU cabinet. Our ground fault has been located in the RTU cabinet. No ground fault is detected coming out of the RTU cabinet. To simulate a ground fault, we used a light bulb connected across the positive bus and ground. As we can see, once the light bulb is removed, the fault is cleared. Wow, that demonstration took me back. That was a uh, presentation that I developed back when I worked for Magger Oh, my goodness, we shot that video in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, and that was about 20-odd years ago. Brought back some, some memories. All right, let's keep moving. Now, another method that has been used uh, considerably is tone tracing. Now, the early product uh, name of uh, that I'm familiar with of a tone tracer for this application was originally called the Brunt Fault Finder. Later was referred to as the Brunt Model 76, and now uh, it is known as the Model 760. The manufacturer is Multitech Industries, and I believe they are out of New Jersey. The 760 detects and locates accidental ground faults on both energized and de-energized power circuits, including single phase, three phase, and DC ungrounded systems, where the 
uh, approach that we just got done viewing was specifically for DC systems only. This tone tracing method uh, used by the model 760 uh, can be used for both uh, ungrounded AC systems as well as DC systems. The 760 automatically determines which phase is grounded and with a handheld portable pickup probe, the operator traces a single, excuse me, a signal tone to the exact point of the fault. So again, the technology used here is very similar. We have a transmitter injecting an AC signal, in this case an AC tone, that we then track through the facility. The 760 is fully portable and can be used at any location in the distribution system. Due to the sensitivity of the pickup probe and adjustable volume control, the tracing signal can be heard as far as 5 feet from the conduit for easy tracing in difficult to reach arenas or areas. Now, this unit, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is still available. I do believe Multitech is still uh, in business and still produces this unit. Uh, again, I have personal experience using this, uh, oh my goodness, going back almost 30 years ago, I had opportunity to use not the 760, but the original Brunt Fault Finder, the predecessor to the 760. And now, uh, some good news. Uh, Megger has a new product uh, update release. And in this video, the product uh, is going to be shown uh, testing an ungrounded DC system. However, what makes this uh, new product launch rather exciting is that it does offer an optional AC filter where this unit can be now used for both DC and with the AC filter can be used on ungrounded AC systems as well. The approach and concept of, of use for the ungrounded AC systems will be very similar in nature as to what you're going to see in this brief presentation. This presentation shall illustrate the general operation of the MEGAR MGFL100 ground fault locator. Before performing any ground fault tracing, we want to first verify a few items. First, verify the battery in the transmitter is fully charged if the unit is to be operated off a of battery. To do this, turn on the transmitter and let it boot up. Verify the battery indicator displays a fully charged battery. This should be a green indication. If it does not, then charge the batteries or you can operate the transmitter off of AC power. Next, verify the batteries in the receiver are good. To do this, turn on the receiver and let it boot up. Then, press the battery button. Verify the battery LED is green. If not, replace the AA batteries in the receiver. If you will be using the optional Active Mini CT, then be sure the battery in the CT is good. To do this, turn on the CT power. Verify the LED illuminates green. If not, install a new 9 volt battery. Now that we've verified the instrument is ready, we want to check the battery ground fault monitor. Battery ground fault monitors can have their own path to ground. This ground path will be in parallel with the unwanted ground you want to trace. If the impedance of the ground you're trying to trace is significantly lower than the impedance of the ground of the ground fault monitor, then this may not be an issue. In this case, the majority of the ground fault tracing current will still go through the fault. However, if the ground you are tracing has a higher impedance, then most of the fault current used for tracing will flow through the ground fault monitor and not the fault you are trying to locate. Therefore, it is recommended to isolate the earth ground from the battery ground fault monitor. Before starting any ground fault tracing, be sure to wear the proper personal protection equipment when connecting the unit and performing tracing. If you'll be operating the transmitter off of AC, then plug the power adapter into the transmitter. Then plug the power adapter into an AC outlet. The power outlet must be from 90 to 264 volts AC 47 to 63 Hz. If powering off a battery, the AC adapter is not required. 
and the fully charged battery should last approximately four hours. Now we are ready to connect the MGFL100. First, plug the green safety earth cable into the transmitter as shown. Then clip the other end to earth. A conduit is a good connection to use. This is a safety connection. This connection verifies that if anything fails in the unit, the case does not become live. Now, plug the green reference cable into the transmitter as shown. Clip the other end to earth. A conduit is also a good connection for this. Plug the black terminal cable into the MGFL100 as shown. Then clip the other end of the black cable to the negative lead of the battery string. Plug the red terminal cable into the MGFL100 as shown. Then clip the other side of the red cable to the positive side of the battery string. The MGFL100 can be used on battery strings up to 600 volts DC. There are also smaller clips available for small connection points. Now we're ready to apply test current and evaluate the fault. Turn on the MGFL100 transmitter and allow it to boot up. During the boot up, the following sequence will take place. First, all the LEDs will display 1888 for 3 seconds. This allows you to verify all the segments of the displays are operating. The firmware version will then be displayed on the lower left voltage display. The build number will be displayed on the lower right voltage display. After the boot up is complete, the lower left display will display the maximum voltage limit. This will be the maximum voltage output you'll be able to set on the transmitter. The lower right screen will display the maximum current output in milliamps. This will be the maximum amount of current you'll be able to get from the transmitter, and these values are programmable. The top two displays will display the positive and negative string voltages. The display with the lower voltage indicates the side of the string with the ground fault. So now we want to inject test current through that side of the string with the ground fault. Press the appropriate output button to enable the output tracing current. If the positive voltage reads lower than the negative voltage, then press the red plus button. If the negative voltage reads lower than the positive voltage, then press the black negative button. A countdown will ensue while the isolation caps charge up. This provides isolation between the transmitter and the battery string, and the countdown shall proceed from 10 to 0. Wait for the countdown to complete. The higher the voltage the transmitter is across, the longer it takes the isolation caps to charge. They need to charge to the level of the string. The charge time is approximately 10 seconds per 100 volts. Once the countdown is complete, the displays will display different values. The lower left display will display the actual voltage output of the transmitter. The lower right display will display the actual current output of the transmitter. Now, turn the voltage adjustment knob clockwise until the current reads approximately 5 milliamps. Note, if you cannot reach 5 milliamps, then the fault is a high impedance fault. Now, this is not a problem. However, when searching for a high impedance fault, it is recommended to view the actual measured values on the receiver's display and not to use the alarms as described later in this presentation. Now, note the readings on the top displays. The left display will indicate the resistance of the ground fault in kiloohms. The right display will indicate the capacitance on the circuit. Note, there is no problem if the capacitance reading displayed is zero. This just means there is minimal stray capacitance on the circuit. Now we are ready to evaluate the fault. Connect the current clamp to the receiver. Place the current clamp around either the positive or negative output lead, whichever one is outputting the current to the fault. Connect the sync cable between the receiver and the transmitter. Now, note the readings on the displays. The top display will indicate the current the fault is drawing. The lower display will indicate the reactive current drawn by stray capacitance on the circuit. It is the actual fault current on the top display that will be traced. Now, press the Save button on the receiver. This will save three values. The total current being drawn by the circuit this will be the value that will be displayed if the sync cable is disconnected. The resistive current being drawn by the fault, or the fault current, 
and the reactive or leakage current being drawn by stray capacitance. These values can be recalled at any time by pressing the recall button on the receiver. Now we know the resistance of the fault and the current being drawn by the fault. We can now identify the circuit with the fault. So now set the alarm level on the receiver to 50%. This means when the measured fault current exceeds 50% of the saved value, an alarm shall be triggered. The alarm will only be triggered on the circuit with the real fault. Current drawn by stray leakage capacitance shall be ignored as long as the sync cable is connected to the receiver. The alarm can be either a visual only alarm or a visual and audio alarm. Turn the dial to the blue section for a visual only alarm. Turn the dial to the orange section for a visual and audio alarm. Place the CT around each wire of each circuit in the panel one at a time. Do not disconnect the sync cable. The top display on the receiver displays the actual current going to the ground fault. Locate the circuit drawing the most current as read on the top display. The alarm on the receiver will trigger when the measured current exceeds 50% of the save value. Now that the circuit with the fault has been identified, we can start tracing the fault. Be sure to have a schematic of the circuit being traced. Now that we know the circuit with the fault, we can disconnect the sync cable from the receiver. The receiver will now only display the total current drawn by the circuit on the top display. This will be inclusive of both the current drawn by the fault, as well as any current drawn by stray or leakage capacitance. The alarm will now be triggered when the measured current exceeds the selected percentage of the total current. You can push the recall button at any time to note the value of the total current. Using the schematic of the circuit, now start tracing the fault current through the circuit. Move the current clamp down the circuit to trace the fault. If the fault current is displayed on the top display of the receiver, then the fault current is still downstream. If the fault current is no longer displayed on the top screen of the receiver, then you've passed the fault. Use this technique to narrow down the location of the fault until it is located. And with that new product introduction, that's going to conclude our webinar today on ground fault detection and locating of ground faults. As always, I greatly appreciate everyone who participates on our third Thursday uh, webinars, uh, giving up your valuable time during your day for you internationals, giving up your valuable evenings and in some cases early mornings to join us we do appreciate you very, very much. All right, without further ado, let's get to those questions.